Okay. Hi, Amen. Thank you for running for office and for seeking Thanks for having me. Yeah, and for seeking the Riveters Collective endorsement. Um, we're conducting this interview on the traditional territory of the Nooksack Tribe and Lummi Nation. This interview is being recorded for us to use in our endorsement decisions and also may be shared publicly. Uh, your screen name looks great. Uh, we have five questions for you. With We're looking for responses like three to four minutes. And hopefully that'll okay. leave room at the end if you have any questions for us. Um, to begin with, how would you prefer to be addressed? Is Eamon good? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Eamon's good. Okay. Uh, and I, I use uh, he, him uh, pronouns. Great. So we're going to just quickly go around and introduce all the people that are here tonight, starting with Lychee. Thanks, Zoe. Um, hello, my name is Lychee Leong. Lychee is my first name, and I'll hand things over to Beth. Thanks, Lychee. Um, hi, Eamon. My name is Beth, and thanks for being here. Thanks for running for office. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Suzanne. Hi there, Eamon. Thanks for being here. My name is Suzanne. Um, looking forward to hearing what you have to say. And um, I'd like to introduce Candice. Hi, Eamon. I would like to thank you for running. Very exciting. And I am very excited for this interview. Thanks. So you're so, be... you're so well organized. This, this is already <laughs> different than other uh, endorsement conversations we've had. So <laughs> that's fantastic to hear. Um, so I'll be asking the questions of you today. The first of which right. is, what do you think is the biggest challenge facing Bellingham today, and how can a city council member contribute to solutions for this challenge? Um, probably no surprise if you um, if you've had a chance to to read through my my questionnaire what what I'm going to say um, I think it's it's affordable housing I, I think there is a, uh, a a terrifying lack of affordable housing um, I don't think the the trend lines are are looking good um, with the the current policies and the leadership that we have in place now um, I uh, I'll, I'll I'll start and I'll try to be be brief with just a a, a small example of um, the, the, it's really the, the project that got me uh, starting to think about running for local office um, in uh, in my neighborhood in the Birchwood neighborhood there is a uh, a three acre uh, vacant parcel it's about a half block from Birchwood Elementary School it's technically six lots there's this dilapidated old um, a warehouse there there's some rusted out cars. Um, and there's an acre of land that's now being used by City Sprouts Farm. Um, Colshan Community Land Trust wants to build 18 permanently affordable townhomes on this site. Uh, under a current incentive program for affordable homes, we could build nine at a 50% density bonus um, over the absolutely impossible to make affordable single family homes that, that would normally be, be built there. Um, at a density of nine homes, we still can't make them affordable. We, we can't make the numbers pencil. Um, it's also just a not a good use of space. So we wanted to build 18 there. Every member of city council and Mayor Fleetwood came out last summer, um, uh, toured, uh, I should say, I think actually it was every council member except one, um, uh, toured the site. Everybody said this is an amazing project. I mean, it's, it's picture perfect. They're going to be uh, extremely energy efficient and like a permaculture landscape. It's urban infill. It's this little neighborhood within a neighborhood right by this elementary school. Any family would be privileged to live there. Um, everybody said, yes, of course, we love this. And yes, we will support increasing this density bonus from 50% to 200%. Couldn't be easier. We wrote the language for them. A year later, nothing has happened. Um, and now Colshan might have to sell the property to, I guess, a, a for-profit developer. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. If if this affordable housing project doesn't work, um, I don't I don't know how anything can under under our current framework. Um, it's astonishingly difficult to to build affordable homes here. Um, the planning process is slow uh, and complex uh, and expensive. There's things like the the design review that that really slows it down. Uh, things like like setbacks and obviously uh, a density. Um, the the most frustrating part to me is that the city knows about all these barriers. In their own consolidated plan, they identify single family zoning and minimum lot size requirements and restrictions on infill development as things that are making it hard to build affordable homes here. That was, it's in their consolidated plan, but they haven't acted to remove them. 
Um, uh, I think also, so just re removing some of those regulatory barriers is what I would be focused on. But also, I know from working with Colton that there is a tremendous amount of expertise around affordable housing in, in this town. Um, not just Colton, but a lot of other organizations that know how to build affordable homes. But like Colton has this, this small skeleton staff. Uh, historically, we just helped people with down payment assistance buy homes on the on the private market. That's no longer possible. Homes have gotten way too expensive. So now this scrappy little nonprofit is a developer, which takes a huge amount of staff time. So if we really wanted to build capacity uh, around all of these, these organizations that have this expertise, um, they just need a little bit of personnel support. They need a little bit of funding to hire a project manager who can manage uh, multifamily developments uh, full time. And uh, the, the the mayor uh, is on a uh, the a county level economic development investment board. Um, uh, this kind of obscure sub county board controls. They have a pot of about twenty seven million dollars that can explicitly be used to build affordable housing, including again explicitly in the statute it says personnel. Um, so the money's there. Uh, they just need to open the, the tap. What the the city has projected um, reserves of something like thirty seven million. So they need to spend a little bit of money so that we are not leaving lots of federal and state dollars uh, on the table, and they need to get some of the, the pointless regulations out of the way. Thank you. So our next question is, how do you plan to involve residents in the city's decision-making process? Um, I, you know, I, I know the, the, the city council um, uh, has these, these public comment periods that um, my sense is, is that it tends to be the, the same few people uh, most of, of the time. Um, and uh, I don't know to what degree they're, they're swayed uh, uh, by, by the public comments. Um, in, if, if I'm thinking particularly about, about housing, again, but, but this would make sense for, for any issue, um, as a city council member, I would like to actually go out in the community and participate in neighborhood meetings. I think when people are in their own space, um, they're a lot more comfortable and they're likely to share their complete thoughts and their reasoning that's not on a on a kind of a, a three minute um, restricted uh, time scale. Um, and I, I think you're you're going to get greater participation and, and more authentic feedback um, if you go to where people are instead of asking them to show up on uh, on Zoom or, or show up uh, at City Hall. Um, yeah, and, and I think they'd, they'd feel um, uh, more more compelled to 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 be uh, totally yeah, honest about where they're feeling some some reservations and maybe where they're feeling some nuance. Like if I if I told my my you know my neighbors that I want to build uh, uh, you know eighteen homes right here, I could see people having having a little heartburn about that and wanting having questions about parking, even though I don't think that <laughs> that should be an issue. And I think parking minimums are a, are a huge barrier again to to building affordable homes. But but people have complicated feelings about this. Anytime you're you're talking about changing something um, from from the way uh, it's been done, and um, I think you can. Um, you know, I, I think most people in our community have have the right intentions, um, and they're and they're worried for very reasonable uh, uh, purposes, and um, and and you can get to a good place um, through through conversation. Thank you. So our next question is: Do you support a local minimum wage that's higher than the state minimum wage? If so, how much higher? Uh, yes, uh, I do. Um, uh, I, I signed on to um, both of, of the uh, ballot initiatives that uh, Community First Whatcom um, has has been pushing. Um, uh, I, I appreciate, although I'm I'm now I'm I'm stepping out of my 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 expertise, and I'm I'm worried I'm I'm wrong. But if I remember right, not only did they they raise the the minimum wage, but uh, didn't they they peg it to to inflation, or it, it will it will rise over time as well? Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, uh, I, I think, um, I mean, even going a, a dollar over minimum wage, but if we're talking $16 an hour, that's like 32,000 a year, like that, that's still not a living wage um, uh, in most places, uh, uh, even here. I, I'm, I'm not an economist. I don't, I don't know exactly where, where the right number is. Um, at, like at what point you would actually, you know, you you could maybe believe businesses if if, if they tell you like like oh we're gonna have to to, to cut workforce um, uh, if you if you raise it that high. Um, but what was a bold progressive policy nationally a few years ago, the the fight for fifteen, um, it seems outdated to me now. Um, I think the number is definitely higher than, than that. 
Um, I, I, I don't know, <laughs> as, as a, a, a public school uh, teacher who uh, uh, often thinks about how, how many essential professions are, are underpaid, um, yeah, I don't, I don't see how you could possibly live on, on uh, 34000 a year if you're making $17 an hour. I don't know, that, that still sounds too low to me, but I, I, I don't have a specific dollar number for you. Thank you. Have, how have you supported or been involved in the Riveters Collective or other civic engagement organizations? Um, I haven't been involved in, in the Riveters Collective. My, um, uh, my experience with, with the Riveters is, uh, only goes so far as getting, uh, getting flyers that had your logo on there and going, oh, that's a, <laughs> that's a cool group. I should, I should Google them. Um, uh, I, uh, I got involved with, um, Colson Community Land Trust that has really been my, uh, my, my entry into, into local activism. Um, uh, and that came about as after, uh, we, we only moved here in, in 2018. We've only been here around five years. Um, uh, I had been a public school teacher at the beginning of my career. Then I worked for five years for the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives on education policy. Um, and uh, by the time I, I left, I was I was very, very eager uh, to leave Washington, D.C. and go back to the classroom um, and leave uh, national politics behind. But after a couple of years here, we uh, uh, there was um, uh, the, the national politics were uh, didn't seem to be getting any less chaotic. And we were in a pandemic and um, I started to feel like um, I, I, I frequently equate it to like a little bit of the, the, the prepper mentality, except I didn't think that there's anything I could do for just my family that would make my family secure um, in this increasingly chaotic world that honestly at a national political level, I think it's only going to get more chaotic. I think climate change is, is a much bigger beast than most people uh, realize that's going to have really far reaching effects. And uh, I, I started thinking, like, I, I don't think I can make my family more secure. I think what will make us secure in the coming uh, decades as, as my three-year-old and my five-day-old are, are growing up um, is making this community as strong and, and stable uh, as I can. And um, housing was an issue I had engaged with um, in the past and was just personally very interested in. Um, and so I reached out to Colson to, to get involved. I, I started um, chairing their advocacy committee and then they asked me to join their board um, and their, uh, their executive committee and um, that led me here. Thank you. So our final question is, as a city council person, how can you support staff in pursuing new and innovative strategies to accelerate progress towards our community goals? I, I love this question. <laughs> um, one, the, uh, I, I, I've been perplexed over the, the last couple of years by uh, the, the, the lack of urgency, right? The, 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 there, there seems to be little understanding and again I'm, I'm you know i'm mainly talking to, to city staff and and elected officials um about housing but there i don't think the crisis could be more evident and i don't understand the the slow pace of, of change i see in reaction to that i don't know why we're just waiting for the state to act and then taking as long as we can to implement state level reforms i don't understand why a progressive engaged community like ours uh isn't going beyond that and, and I've, I've been trying to figure out where the disconnect is. And as I've talked to, to some elected officials, I, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that city council has what, one, one or two staffers that, that, that works for, for the entire council. Um, uh, I think their uh, city council's ability to uh, hold the executive branch um, uh, accountable um, and to um, engage more deeply uh, with policy issues is severely limited by the fact that that they don't have like each city council member doesn't have their own uh, staff assistant or, or, or legislative assistant. Um, uh, now I'm a little biased as a former legislative assistant um, uh, my, myself, um, but if if my boss, the, the senators I worked for, if they were going into hearings and they were just asking questions that were written for them uh, uh, by um, the staff for for the secretary of the department that they were supposed to be badgering, like they wouldn't. They, they, it, it's healthy to have a little bit of of confrontation there to have slightly different sets of facts or a staff member that understands your your particular priorities. So I feel like right now the the, the city staff mainly kind of guides the the, the ship. Um, they're accountable to to the mayor, um, and and of course um, there there's just kind of a a natural uh, structural resistance to change that, that that's there. Then um, so I uh, uh, yeah I I think that. Um, 
if, if I were elected to council, I would push very strongly uh, uh, to get council members um, a legislative assistance. I think that would make a huge difference. Great, thank you. So um, we have a little bit of time if you have any questions for the Riveters, especially since it doesn't seem that you, well, first of all, I was gonna say congratulations on the baby. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I, I, I picked a great time to run for office. <laughs> Um, I, I'm like, yeah, right, right. When you have a baby, like that's when you really got to like find, find some things to do, you know, pick up a new hobby. Yeah, um, it's really easy on the sleep deprivation. <laughs> yes. Um, um I, yeah. So anyway, uh, I'm wondering if you had any questions for us. Yeah. Well, I, I'd, I'd, um, uh, I'd love to, so I, I, know, I understand the, 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 the Riveters, um, uh, came about as a, 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 a local political reaction, um, uh, to like the, the election of, uh, of, of Trump in, in 2016. Um, I, I don't have a, a deep understanding of, um, in what ways you, you engage in, in campaigns. Um, like I'm, I'm curious, um, if you like, uh, participate in, in door knocking, um, or if it's, um, uh, primarily like like an endorsement processes and, and defining kind of policy platforms or um, uh, yeah, what what kind of local levers uh, politically and, and in terms of policy are, are the Riveters using? Suzanne, do you wanna? Um, I, I, I will answer it if Beth doesn't. Um, um, would you like to start Beth this one and I'll, I'll pile on? Sure. So Suzanne is the current board president for the nonprofit organization. So she would have a better idea of what the plans are for this year. I would say that, um, you know, we, we did endorsements for the first time in 2017. And um, since then, it's really been um, a mixed bag. It kind of depends on the year and the capacity that we have. And, um, and so we've done as much as, you know, um, raised forty thousand dollars and knocked on twenty thousand doors. Um, wow. I don't think that's this year. <laughs> um, so I think there's there's a whole host of things. I mean, we've run a pack two or three times, and I don't think there's plans for that this year. So I think what's going to what Suzanne is probably going to say is something similar to last year, where it's not under a pack, so it's things that can be done without spending money. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Suzanne, you want to take from there? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we're ha like um, just adding a little bit to what Beth said, you know, we're always interested in finding the place where we can add value to a campaign season and do something that we can um, um, demonstrate with data was effective. And so that was what we tried to do with um, a few of our independent expenditure type campaigns and it just takes a lot of resources and time and um and like Beth said that's not this year I don't think we have the um we don't have the idea the niche the um that thing where we feel like we might be able to make a real difference um and we also um don't have the um the resources uh time or money probably this year so what we try to do when we don't do a campaign like that is to partner with other organizations um, to support door knocking events, um, do some of our own if we can pull it together. Um, just anything like Beth said that doesn't doesn't cause um doesn't cause us to spend any money as an organization. Mm -hmm. um, so um there, and sorry go Suzanne. Ahead. One strategy we've used in the last couple of years, which I feel like was really successful, was um cash flash. And so we have for every endorsed candidate, we had like a week or a day or something like that. And then we tried to, you know, leverage all of our communication resources to raise money that went directly to that campaign. So um, oh. we were not, we were not like taking money through the organization, in which case we would have had to activate the pack. We just had people direct doing it. And so we raised probably about a thousand dollars a candidate doing that. Oh, wow. um, uh, and do you do, um, do dual endorsements? So um, my understanding of our, is that we, we take a pragmatic approach. So I think our position is that um, by the time you, people are on the ballot, like 98% of the work has already been done, right? So um, we feel like we should make one, try to make one and only one endorsement in every race. And um, the committee has the discretion to recommend a dual endorsement in we, we kind of expect it to be unusual. And then also sometimes there's no endorsement. Um, yeah. But 
the goal is to have one in each race. Okay. Okay. Cool. Good to know. Okay. Thank you so much, Eamon, for coming in. And I hope you get to sleep tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, and thanks for, for taking the, the time and um, uh, raising these. Your, your questions were, I had to do some homework. They, those were good uh, questions. And I, uh, I'm, I'm, it makes me really happy to, to live in a community that there are so many engaged um, progressives that are holding uh, elected officials and, and candidates to, to account like really specifically. This, the, it was fantastic. So thanks for your time. Thanks, Eamon. Thank you. Thank you.